Welcome to the Refuge Sermon of the Week. To listen to any of our other messages, or to get involved, head over to therefuge.online. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Jerry Alston. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your precious, holy written word. Would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to receive uh, what you want to speak to us? Uh, Would you, uh, as I talk, speak to the hearts of the people here uh, so that they hear what you want them to hear, um, not what I want them to hear? Um, Would you cause me to speak only truth and only what is right and only what is accurate? And would you uh, fix anything um, that's not right in what I say? We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So, as I said, we're on this series titled First Things First, and we're, we've taken it from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. We'll put it up on the screen where Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. And so, as we've been saying, we have this incredible promise from the Lord that if we'll put first things first, we can have this life where all the other stuff is added unto us, a life where we We don't have to strive and work for our own needs to be met, but we can uh, put his kingdom first and know that he is going to take good care of us. He says that, you know, your heavenly father knows that you have need of these things and he'll take care, good care of you as you put first things first. We've also learned from this that as we put first things first and we have our priorities right, not only do we have this assurance that he will take good care of us, but we have this assurance that we can live a life free from worry. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good life to me, where we don't have to stress and worry about things and be fearful. He says, you don't need to worry. Just put first things first. And then the third great promise I see in his teaching here is that as we have our priorities right, we know that we're actually investing in building something that's eternal. And that means so much to me that uh, we know that he says, don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but lay up treasures in heaven that will be a, that will endure forever and i've kind of jokingly said along this series that we're all going to outlive our 401k's i don't care what your investment banker tells you he'll tell you to save enough money so that uh, your retirement fund uh, will last as long as you last well i promise you that is impossible because you will live forever in one of two places i hope you choose well um, but uh, but you will live forever and long after our 401k's are gone and long after our, not that there's anything wrong with those things, they're good things to have, um, but if our trust is in those things, we know that that's not durable riches. And so as we learn to get our priorities right and put things the way God wants them, we have this great promise that long after all of it's gone, we'll still have this rich reward in heaven, durable riches. Doesn't that sound awesome? And so he tells us how to do it, and that's in this series what we've been talking about is how do, we, how do we get our priorities where they should be. Jesus entered the scene in Matthew 4, 17. We've used this scripture every week during this series. When Jesus first comes on the scene and first declares his public ministry, he utters these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We know that word repent simply means change the way you think. You used to think this way, now I want you to begin to think this way. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus continually teaches. If you read the gospels and you read the words of Jesus over and over again, you'll see him referencing the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. He wraps up his um, earthly ministry in Matthew after he's risen from the dead. And he makes this statement, all authority has been given to me in Matthew chapter um, uh, 28, 18, and 19. All authority has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I like to paraphrase this scripture this way. Jesus shows up. He's risen from the dead. He's getting ready to go sit at the right hand of the Father. And he looks at each of us and he says, I'm the king. Go build my kingdom. Isn't that what he said? All authority has been given to me. Now go make disciples. Go make followers. I'm the king. 
go build my kingdom. Over 50 times in Matthew alone, Jesus references a kingdom. About 128, I believe, times in your New Testament, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is mentioned. It is the dominant theme in your Bible. And unfortunately, we don't teach enough about this. And because we live in America, we don't really understand what a kingdom is in the first place, right? Because we live under a republic. And so a kingdom is a kind of a foreign um, idea or concept to us as Americans. So we're at a bit of a disadvantage. And so with that, we've been spending a lot of time in this series reminding ourselves and bringing our, to our remembrance what a kingdom actually is. If we're supposed to be seeking first a kingdom, then don't you think it would be good for us to continually remember what a kingdom actually is in the first place? Because after all, how are we going to seek something if we don't recognize it when we see it? If we don't even know the concept of, of what it is? is. And my hope is, is that when this series is over, that you will continue to look at the Word of God and seek God's presence and in prayer from a kingdom perspective. I, I hope that you don't lose this. I hope that you keep this idea because when you begin to read your Word, looking at it as a kingdom principle, when you begin to pray and enter God's presence from a kingdom position, it changes everything in you. It changes how you approach Him. It changes how you pray, it changes how you see the whole purpose of the church. And so my hope and my prayer for you is that you continue to explore God's word and God's presence from a kingdom perspective. Let's look one more time at Matthew chapter 16, 18, and 19. This is such a profound revelation. We've taught a fair amount on it here but as we get ready to close this series, I want to, one more time, bring it to your remembrance when Jesus is talking about building his church. So uh, Peter uh, gets this revelation that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. And so Jesus says, uh, Peter, upon this revelation of, of who you see that I am, I'm going to build my church, right? And so he says this. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In the 18th verse, and I will also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not be able to prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom He's always talking about a kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is perhaps, uh, I think I say this a lot. But these days, this is my favorite passage from Jesus' teaching. Because it simplifies and clarifies the mission of the church. When I understand what Jesus just said right here, all of a sudden the church makes perfect sense to me. Jesus says, I will build my church. We know that that word church is not the word that Jesus used. He said, I will build my ecclesia. We know that he borrowed that word ecclesia. Jesus purposefully chose to use, he could have chosen any word. If he was talking about what we are doing right now, he would have said, I will build my synagogue. This is synagogue in, in, the old, in the old language and in the Old Testament. And it's an important part of what we do. But this is not church. It is not the church. The church is ecclesia, which was a borrowed word from the Roman government. It was a word that everybody was familiar. When Jesus said ecclesia, all of his followers instantly tripped to a kingdom and a government. Jesus enters the scene in Matthew 4. Change the way you're thinking because the kingdom of heaven is upon you. Every Jewish citizen in that day was awaiting the Savior. All as they knew from for, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the tradition had been passed down to them that a Savior is coming to deliver you from an evil, oppressive government. Right? They, 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 every time they took Passover together as a Jewish family, they're, they're remembering that there's a Savior coming and he's going to deliver us. The Roman government had grown and grown and grown and got more and more oppressive and got to this place to where the, the, um, 
uh, the, the, the Jewish people were completely under oppression. Jesus shows up and says, repent for the, key, for, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They get excited. Could this be the savior? Could this be our deliverance? Could this be the king that's coming to set up a new government, right? And then Jesus says this to his followers. I'm going to build my ecclesia. As soon as he said that, they're going, that's it. Ecclesia, because an ecclesia is an authorized arm of the government sent to do a mission. They're authorized by the government. And so when Jesus says, I'm building my ecclesia, he says, I'm going to build a group of people, a group of called out ones, and I'm going to send them to build my kingdom. So now the disciples are all getting super excited. They're getting super pumped up, but they wonder, could it really be? Could he really pull it off? Could he really do it? And then Jesus goes about and starts to do some really fascinating things like healing the dead, like healing the sick like raising the dead, like casting out demons, like walking on water, like turning water into wine. He starts doing all of these things and they're going, man, this cat's for real. Like he really, he, like, like he, see, he says his kingdom is coming. If, if he can raise the dead, if, if he can heal lepers, if he can walk on the water, if he can turn water to wine, if he can do all of these things, he can actually pull off overthrowing the Roman government. He can actually do it. He says, I'll build my ecclesia, I'll build my kingdom. I'll build the, the, this group of people sent out to build my kingdom. And he says, the gates of, of, of Hades, not hell, the gates of Hades or the kingdom of hell will not be able to prevail against it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to authorize a group of people to go into the earth and build my kingdom and the kingdom of hell will not be able to stand against them. And whatever they bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever they loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And we know that, that if, if you look at the original language, what it's really saying is whatever has been bound in heaven will be bound on earth, and whatever has been loosed on he, on, in heaven will be loosed on earth. In other words, our job, our whole, the whole purpose for the church is to simply be this authorized group of sent out ones to bring the culture of heaven to earth. And now it gets super simple for me. Now all of a sudden I've, I'm not confused about what a church is supposed to be doing anymore. All this we're supposed to do is, is, is know the best we can and imagine, because I don't know, what is heaven like? I'm not totally sure, are you? But I can imagine what I think heaven is like. I can pray and I can look into God's word and get glimpses of what heaven is like. And then I can do my very best to bring that culture to earth. And then I get to spend time in his presence. And when I spend time in his presence like we just did, I can't help but come out of his presence with a clearer glimpse of what, oh, that's kind of like what heaven's like. Like, oh, oh, that's, that's what heaven's like. Now, tomorrow morning when I go to work, I get to try to bring that culture to my workplace. And that's all the church is. Am I going to be successful at it? I don't know. I'm going to do my best. The results aren't my responsibility. I'm an authorized agent of the king. I'm the ecclesia. That's why Jesus, when he wraps this whole thing up, says, all authority has been given to me. Now, Patty, go build my kingdom. And Patty says, well, I, how do I do that? Just go be you. Just go do your best to bring heaven to earth. And so with that, we've been, we've been spending some time talking about um, what is a kingdom in the first place. And we've said this each week, that a king, kingdom has to have three things. It has to have a king. Jesus is king. He doesn't need you to make him king. God did that when he raised him from the dead. I assure you he's king, right? Uh, a kingdom needs a territory. And so uh, we know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So um, if you want to not live in God's territory, there's only one place you can go to do that. And I strongly discourage you from doing that. <laughs> right? If you're in heaven or if you're on earth, you're in God's territory. So we have a king, King Jesus. We have a territory, the heavens and the earth. And then in order for there to be a kingdom, we need a third thing, and that's, his, and that's subjects. And you, we are all the subjects of the king living in his kingdom go, with the job to go about and do his will which is simply to bring heaven to earth. 
That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. We're authorized agents to bring heaven to earth. That's all we need to be doing. So, so simple. And so uh, we said this, that in order for... so so. In order for there to be a kingdom in the first place, there needs to be a king, there needs to be a territory, and there needs to be subjects. In order for a kingdom to be successful, we've said this, that first of all, there needs to be unity. Unity. We said unity doesn't mean that everybody agrees on everything, but that we unite around a common thing. We have a common theme that, you know, we could, we could sit and discuss with all of us in this room and there would be varying differences on doctrine, so-called doctrine. But if we can all agree that Jesus is the king and the goal is to bring the culture of heaven to earth, then let's agree on that and let's be united in that cause. Then the kingdom can be healthy and it can grow and it can expand. It needs unity. We said that every kingdom needs obedience. As subjects to the king, we need to be obedient to him and we talked about how beautiful and simple a life of obedience is it's 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 just um you know we we talked about in the in the garden of eden there was one thing that that um god didn't want man to know and that was the knowledge of good and evil and that's such a weird thing to me because as a parent i so want my kids to know good from evil right and i get that we need to do that but in the original intent of the father was we weren't even supposed to know from good, good from evil. And then I begin to imagine what would life be like if I had actually no concept of good and evil and all as I knew was simple obedience to the father. Wow. Like my, my headspace gets freed up really quick when I go there. Like you mean I don't have to even worry about whether or not people are doing things right or wrong? I don't, I don't have to judge all this stuff that's going on in the world. I don't even have any concept of whether or not it's right or wrong. That frees up a whole lot of headspace. I don't have to constantly wonder whether I'm, you know, good or bad or trying to define good from bad. All I have to do is simply obey the Father. The Father says, go, I go. The Father says, don't go, I don't go. Mm, what a life. What a life, if only. Uh, and then we said loyalty, that every... Every kingdom, in order for it to be successful, needs subjects that are loyal, and we talked about that last week. This week, as we wrap it up, I want to talk about kind of the final key for a kingdom to be successful. It needs unity. It needs obedience. It needs loyalty. And the fourth and most important thing it needs is love. It is love. And uh, because we can have all of these things, but if we don't have love, um, then it can get twisted quite quickly. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Of course, the very familiar, very well-known scripture on love. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, verses 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am no- nothing. And though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. The way we say it at the refuge is love must be the loudest thing in the room. And what we learn from this scripture is that in the kingdom of God, everything must be um, covered, if you will, with love. We must lead with love. Uh, if love is not the thing that... that, that um, covers our obedience, then our obedience becomes twisted. He, he says that no, no, no matter what the good thing is, if, if you don't have love, it becomes a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. Those th- two things to me represent distractions and annoyances, and just all of a sudden the good thing becomes an annoying thing. All of a sudden, All of a sudden the right thing becomes an unprofitable thing. 
He says, you can do all of these things, but if you don't have love, it, it just it becomes nothing. And so my loyalty and my obedience and my faithfulness and my, and, my, and my unity and all of these things that I do to be a subject of the king, if I don't have love, they actually become twisted and unprofitable. And unfortunately, we've seen way too much of this in the church, the church worldwide. We've seen the church do so many good things seemingly good things and we could we could we could pound on scripture and we can we can tell people why why this is right and why this is wrong and we can we can and we can you know demand that this is this is right and this is what we need to do and even if it is right it becomes completely unprofitable because it's not covered with love and this is something guys as the ecclesia we got to get a grip on this because in case you haven't noticed the world's going mad at a rapid rate, right? And we can debate and tell people right from wrong till the cows come home and it will not produce fruit. Love is what's going to change the world. All of these things grounded in love is what is going to change the world. We've been saying this statement to leave the debate stage and join the dinner table. Just invite people to his presence instead of trying to... Because, again, the church just has this terrible history of trying to determine right from wrong. They're not any better at it than the rest of the world is. The church has done some horrific things back in history. If you want to look back at some things, look back at the Crusades and some of the things that went on in ancient history. The church has done some horrific, ungodly things in the name of religion. So we're not very good at it. But if we just lead with love, if we just make sure that love is the loudest thing in the room, we move from that place. John 4, 7 through 12. First John 4, 7 through 12 says that, uh, well, I'll read it. Let me turn here. <clears throat> First John 4, and uh, beginning in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Uh, that, um, that statement um, escapes my understanding, for God is love. Um, I haven't been able to wrap my, my brain, really, or my heart around. What does it mean, God is love? I don't fully know, but I know that he is love. In this, the love of God was manifest towards us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the uh, propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love him. And then in the 12th verse, and this is fascinating right here to me, no one has seen God at any time. If we want love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. No one has seen God at any time. But if we love God, God abides in us. So I can't see God. But if you love, if you love God, then God abides in you. And I can see you. So if I see you and God is love, then when I see you, I'm seeing God. Amen. You are the express image of God. This gets deep. <laughs> this gets a little deep, okay? This gets a little woo. But, but it's, power, it's a powerful truth. It's a powerful truth. No one has ever seen God. God is love. But if you love, then God is in you. So when I see you, I can see God. Amen. Love is the primary agent for the advancement of the kingdom. Without love, no matter how hard we try to advance the kingdom of God, and again, I think this is where, where, where we've gotten, where we've, where we've just 
Every time there's not... This is always me looking for permission, in case you're wondering. Um, so, many, so many times we intend well, and, and, and we long to see change, and we want to bring heaven to earth, but, but love is, is the primary agent to actually bring about change. It, it has to be the thing that, that just absolutely dominates everything that we do. This is the whole deal. This is how Jesus, this is the upside down kingdom, okay? This is, this, is where, this is where the kingdom of the world kingdoms and God's kingdoms start to get very, very different. There are similarities between all kingdoms. A king, a territory, subjects, unity, loyalty, all of those things, all kingdoms share. But this right here is where it starts to separate very, very quickly between God's kingdoms and the kingdoms of the world. And this is why the, the, the followers of Jesus and the people in Jesus' day got so angry. This is because because Jesus brought his kingdom to fruition by this incredible act of love. Here is this guy who comes and he declares he's king. Right. Change the way you're thinking for the kingdom of heaven is upon you, right? And then he goes out and he does all this stuff to demonstrate that he actually has the power to pull it off. These guys are pumped up and they're excited. I've seen what this guy can do. This guy spoke to a tree and the tree died. What do you think is going to happen when he speaks to the, to, the, to, 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 the, to the Roman king? If he can kill a tree with his words, he's going to have no problem overthrowing this evil king. Right? This is what they were all excited about. This is why on Palm Sunday when Jesus rode in on a donkey, they're all crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. Hosanna to the king. Yeah, he's getting ready to smoke somebody, Jack. He's coming in and, and I've, we've seen what he can do. Right? We've watched him move in power. He's declared his kingdom. And now he's coming in and he's getting ready to clean house and it's going to be awesome. And the disciples are going, who's going to get to sit at his right hand when he ascends to the throne? I hope it's me. Right? And they're all like pumped up. They just can't wait to see how he's going to do it. And how does he do it? By the most incredible act of love. He hangs on a cross and he gives his life. Which is why, now all of a sudden it makes sense, why this same group of people who were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king, started to cry out just a couple of days later, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Because he showed in their eyes weakness. When they yelled out, crucify him, was at his weakest moment. He had already been beaten. He had already had pieces of his beard pulled out. His face was bloody. The thorn was already maybe on him. He was already defeated in their eyes. And they bring him before the people and they say, what should we do with this man? Should we let him go or should we crucify him? And the people cry out, crucify him because he's not the king we thought he was going to be. Crucify him because he didn't do what we thought he was going to do. He, he wins the battle over death, hell, and the grave by an act of love, not by an act of violence, not by an act of proving he was right or debating with somebody just by love. I'll just give it all. Man, church, when we begin to figure this out, that we are an authorized agent of the government. Jesus is king, and he advances his agenda primarily through love. Real quick, we won't keep you much longer. Let's get a little bit practical here now. So how do, we, how do we learn how to lead with love? I, I said this last week, and it was really a, it was really a pretty cool revelation to me in the moment that um, we know that God's love for us is perfect. There's nothing I can do or not do that changes how God loves me. But my love for him is not yet perfect, right? Um, you know, there, there's times I miss it. And I don't love him the way I wished I would love him. And so my love for him is still growing and still maturing and still being 
perfected. And so how do I learn how to, how to lead with love? What are some things that I can do? I love this in Romans 5.5. 5, we have this great encouragement that tells us that now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That gives me such encouragement to know that the love of God has been poured into my heart by the Holy Spirit. So I have the capacity to love with the love of God. Not because I'm a great guy, not because I'm smart, not because of anything other than the fact that the Holy Spirit, one of his roles, one of his assignments that the Father gave the Holy Spirit is, hey, go pour my love into these people. They're going to need it. So go pour my love into their hearts. So we have his love. We have the capacity to love. I find in my life three hindrances to leading with love. And we'll put them up on the board. The first one is self-preservation. Anytime I try to, anytime I try to preserve myself, I, love suffers in my life. My love walk begins to wane when I begin to think that I need to preserve myself. This is, I think, why Jesus said, we, you need to get your priorities right. Seek first the kingdom of God. All the other stuff will be added onto you. You don't need to worry about preserving yourself. I'll take care of you. For, for me, it's, it's, it's some of the, these mistakes I make in, in love is when I, I feel threatened. I feel like I need to do something to preserve my own reputation or to preserve my own, my own stuff or protect my own self in some way. When I believe that if I don't take care of myself, I won't be taken care of, love suffers. Can I say that again? When I, when I believe that if I don't take care of myself, I won't be taken care of, love suffers. And this is not a popular teaching in the day we live in because we live in the day that's all about self-care and self-help, right? And, and mm, I'm on a short leash these days. Number two, self-promotion. Self-promotion. Anytime I feel the need to make myself look good or take the credit or prove to somebody that I'm right and, and that I have some truth that they don't have, anytime I'm promoting myself, love suffers. Number three, self-gratification. Self-gratification. And I wrestle with this, right? Like I see something and it's like, you know, yeah, you know. I'm, I'm on the boat kick again. It's like it's, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's almost, it's the, the fall Chinook are coming. They're right around the corner. And if, if I just had a boat, I'd be happy. I'd be a little happy. Maybe I wouldn't be happy. I'd be a little happier. A little happier. Sure. I can actually get on these kicks where I feel, it, it, you, ever, you ever find yourself in a season where you just feel a little dissatisfied? It's just like, you're just like, just, I'm just not satisfied. I'm just not, I find myself in those seasons a lot. And if I'm not careful, I can let those feelings of dissatisfaction take me down this path of trying to find self-gratification. I'll pray for my wife. Because when I'm in those seasons, I'm looking for what's the thing I need that's going to make me just a little bit happier? Maybe if I just had a little bit bigger shop, you know? Maybe if I had, you know, um, you know, there's a couple of fishing rods that I actually don't have. I've probably got 10, but there's a couple that I actually don't have yet. And maybe if I had one of those, I'd be satisfied. <laughs> and, and my wife will watch me go down this road of, of, you know, and you can always tell because I get on my phone and I start scrolling for stuff for sale. <laughs> I'm, I'm preaching to the choir right now, aren't I? Huh? <laughs> I start scrolling for, for, for something for sale and, and I'm like, ooh, man, if I had that, that'd be cool. <laughs> uh, 
self-gratification, when, when really what's going on in those moments is my, my spirit is hungry for more of God and more of the kingdom and more of his presence, and I'm looking in the wrong place. My priorities are off. I'm not putting first things first. And fortunately, I've lived long enough that I actually know that no matter how much stuff I have, it's never going to fill that gap. It's never going to fill that need. But yet even though I still can get caught in those moments where I'm looking for something to bring self-gratification, and when I do, my love walk always suffers. Because the focus becomes geared to all of those things, self Preservation, self-promotion, self-gratification, all turn my eyes inward where I'm looking at me. And love is the opposite of that. So I want to share with you as we close, real quickly, two activities that promote love. I gave you three things that I found in my life hinder my love walk. And I want to share with you quickly two things that we can do in our life that will actually promote our love walk. The first one is a lovely scripture we all get excited about, and I'm sure read every day. And that's in Luke, the ninth chapter, and the 23rd verse. And then he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whatever, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The, the, the number one activity in my life that I can do to promote love is denying myself. Again, a very unpopular topic in today's um, self-help. Um, I need a... I need a me day. I need a mental health day culture that we live in. <laughs> there, there probably aren't a whole lot of professionals out there today giving people who are suffering with depression and, and anxiety and stress, advising their clients, you need to deny yourself. That's the answer to your problem. You need to, desi- you need to deny yourself. You need to quit looking at yourself. It's not all about you. I could never be a psych. Psychologist, could I? <laughs> Nobody would pay good money to come and see me. You want to come see me next week? <laughs> here's, here's the answer to your problem. You, 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 want it, you want depression to leave? You want anxiety to leave? You want to feel better? You want to feel better? Quit thinking about yourself. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. He says, it's fascinating, this amazing thing. Again, this is the upside down kingdom. Because whoever seeks to save his life actually ends up losing his life. And whoever loses his life actually ends up finding his life. This is the beauty of taking up your cross daily and following him. When I say no to my needs, when I say no to, I don't need to self-gratification, self-promotion. I need to say no to myself, and I need to let my love be the loudest thing in the room. Then all of a sudden, I actually find the life that I've been longing for all along, a life of meaning, a life of purpose, where I'm putting first things first. All the other stuff's being added unto me. I'm not worried and fearful anymore, because what do I have to fear? I've already laid down my life. I've already lost my life. I don't have anything to fear. (laughs) Summertime at the refuge. (laughs) I learn more and more that true joy comes from serving, not being served. I learn more and more that true joy comes from hearing, not being heard. (laughs) 
And then number two, and then we'll let you go. We've used this, I believe, as a point in, I think, I think probably half of the weeks that we've been on this series, you can go back and look, and this has been a point that goes with each and every one of those. How do I promote love in my life? Spend time with the one who is love. Spend time with him. In the 15th chapter of John, we've talked about this a couple of times through this series, and I'm just going to leave you with this one more time. Jesus makes this really cool statement. I'm the true vine. My father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Then in the fourth verse, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, nor can you unless you abide in me. There is this incredible invitation from Jesus to abide with him, to be in his presence, and a promise that when we spend time in his presence, we'll come out of his presence every time more like him. You can't spend time with him without becoming more like him. That's why he invites you to the table. I love what, who was it we were talking about? Simon that that said, come and see. Andrew Andrew said to Simon when he first recognized, decided to follow Jesus. And Andrew goes to Simon and said, man, you know, we've found the Messiah. And I love what he says to Simon. He says, come and see. Just come and see. Just, 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 Just come and see. Just spend time with him. Instead of me trying to convince you of something, just come and see. Let's just, let's just sit at his table. Let's just sit in his presence. This is why we do worship the way we do worship. here. Just come and see. We had worship practice Friday night, and, and the presence of God fell, and Jeremy went off, and we just sat here for the longest time. I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I lost track of time. And, and just, just, just come and see. Spend time with me. And, and he, in, in this 15th chapter of John, he says, every time you spend time with me, I will prune you and you will come out of my presence more like me every single time. And if he is love, then our love walk will grow every time. We hope you enjoyed that message by Pastor Jerry Alston. If you would like to partner with us or for more information, visit our website at therefuge.online.